Hello everyone. In today's video, we're going to be covering the run length encoding problem. In this problem, we are given a run length encoding and we have to write the implementation for the iterator of this run length encoding. So a run length encoding, or RLE for short, is a compressed representation of a sequence of numbers. It alternates between the frequency of the number in the original sequence and the value of the number itself. So let's say that the encoding we are given is this. This would be the RLE for this original sequence. Let me explain why. Let's look at the first pair of numbers in the encoding, 6 and 10. 6 represents the frequency of the second number, 10, in the original sequence. Notice that there are 6 10s in the original sequence. For the second pair of numbers, the 2 and the 5, this represents two fives in the original sequence. Next, we have one and six, so you can see that there is one six in the original. And finally, it is possible that we can get a zero. Like here, we have a frequency of zero for the value of four, and in the original encoding, this just means that it doesn't show up at all. Now that we know what a run length encoding is, let's get back to the problem of implementing an iterator. So here's the skeleton of what you would be given for the problem. The first part of the code is the constructor where you are past the encoding. The second part is the next method. This is used to iterate through the sequence. It takes in one parameter n, which represents how many elements to iterate through before returning a value from the sequence. This is probably a bit confusing, so let's go through an example to see how this would be used to clear things up. On the right here, we have a main method, which shows how your program might be called. First, we have the RLE iterator object being constructed with the encoding of 6, 10, 2, 5, 1, 6, 0, 4. This means our original sequence looks like this. Our iterator, before any calls are made, is sitting before the first element. So if we call next with 1 as the parameter, it should move our iterator by one position which would return that first 10. Next, if we call test.next5, it's going to move our iterator by five positions, which makes it land on the last 10. Then if we call test.next2, the iterator moves two positions, returning the five. And finally, if we call test.next2 again, it goes past the six and there are no more elements left, so we return negative one as our answer. The last thing is the constraints of the problem. The major constraints of the problem are all the elements in the encoding are going to be greater than or equal to zero. And also the parameter passed in for next, n, is going to be strictly greater than zero. And the third constraint is that the number of dot next calls is limited to 100, a constant number. Now that you hopefully have a better understanding of the problem, let's look at the first possible solution. The brute force solution is just going to be a simulation of the iterator. For the constructor, we initialize an index variable, which is going to start off at zero. We also need an encoding instance variable to save our encoding. For the next method, we initialize a variable called value, which is the value we ultimately return. While our index is less than the length of the encoding and n is greater than zero, we have two cases. If the current encoding is greater than zero, we set the value equal to the index plus one. Remember that this plus one is because the first number in the pair of an encoding is the frequency of a value, and the second number is the value itself. Next, we decrement the frequency, which is self.encoding of self.index. This is symbolizing us consuming a number in the sequence. We also have to decrement n by one as a count. Ultimately, we need to move the iterator n times to arrive at the return value. So by decrementing, we're keeping track of this. The other case, the else case, happens when the frequency is not greater than zero. In other words, it is zero. In this case, we need to move on to the next pair in the encoding. And we do this by incrementing the index by two. Finally, if it is ever the case that our index has gone past the last valid pair, in other words, it is equal to the length of the encoding array, it means that we have run out of elements in the sequence to iterate over, so we return negative one. 
Let's go through an example test run to double check we understand how the code is working. In our main method, when we initialize the iterator, we have zero as the index and the encoding is the array that is passed in. When we make our first call to next, we start off with a value of negative one and we check the while loop condition. Both conditions pass, so we enter the while loop body. Since self.encoding of self.index is six, which is greater than zero, we enter the if statement and set the value to index plus one, and then we decrement n and self.encoding of self.index by one. Now we go back up to the while condition where the second part of the statement n is greater than zero is now false, so we exit the while loop. And move down to the if statement here. This is false, so we skip the body and return the value, which is 10. For the next call in the main method, we pass in five as n. On the first iteration, this while loop passes. Here the if condition passes because self.encoding of self.index is five, which is greater than zero. So now we enter the if body. This causes us to once again set the value variable and we decrement self.encoding of self.index and we decrement n. We now jump back up to the while condition, which is true, and also the if condition, which is true. This causes us to once again set the value variable and decrement the self.encoding of self.index and n. You can hopefully see how it makes sense that this while loop runs three more times before n is zero and the while condition fails. And we jump down to this if condition, which also fails. So we return the value variable, which is 10. Now we move on to the next line in the main function, where next is called with the parameter n as two. For this call, we see that the while condition once again passes, but this time the if condition fails because self.encoding of self.index is zero, which is not greater than zero. So we instead go to the else block, which increments the index by two. So now that lands on the two. We jump back up to the while loop condition, which is true. The if condition is also true, so we set the value to self.encoding of self.index plus one, which is five. We also decrement the index as well as n. We go back up to the while loop, which passes, and we go into the if statement once more. This has us set the value once again to five, decrement the index to zero, and decrement n to zero. Now the while condition fails, and we jump down to this if condition, which also fails, so we return the value variable, which is five. At this point, I'm going to stop tracing through the solution, but you should check for yourself that the last call to a test.next of two returns negative one. Hopefully at this point, you have a better understanding of the solution. So let's discuss the time and space complexity. If we let S be the length of the original sequence and N be the length of the encoding, then the time complexity is going to be O of S. This is because of this line of code here, which makes it possible for us in the worst case to decrement by one for every frequency in the encoding, which represents every single number in the original sequence. For space, it's a little bit up for debate because it depends on whether you consider the encoding input array to be extra space. Another thing to consider is the context of this problem. Do you want to think of solving this problem in the scope of a real world situation or an interview situation? In the real world, iterators usually don't modify the values in a structure they are iterating on. Our algorithm unfortunately does modify the values. So in order to avoid modifying the original values, we really should have made a deep copy and did the manipulation on that. But in the context of the interview, it's kind of up to you to ask your interviewer to see if modifying the input is okay. You should also note that it is possible to implement a variation of this algorithm without actually modifying the input array and I'll challenge you to come up with that implementation yourself. Personally, I'm not going to count the input array as extra space, so I'm going to say that this is a constant space solution, but again, there is certainly room for debate there. Okay, now that we have come up with an initial working solution, let's try to improve it. To get an idea for our improved solution, let's think back to the costly step in our brute force solution. If you remember when we were discussing the time complexity, we discovered that this line of code here was what was costing us time. Overall, the algorithm processes one element in the original sequence one by one. Let's try and avoid doing this by instead processing in batches. What we're going to do is compare the frequency of our current index to n. 
and instead of decrementing by one, if n is greater than our current index value, we just subtract the frequency value from n and move on to the next value. So for example, if our index is here and dot next gets called with n as seven, we can see that n is greater than the current index. So we know that we're going to consume and move past all six of the tens. Rather than doing that one by one, we can instead subtract off self.encoding of index, which would be six to get one. Since after our subtraction n is still positive, we would move on to the next number. Here, since n is no longer greater than the frequency at our index, we account for the remaining n, which in this case is just one by subtracting one off of our frequency. And now that n is zero, we would just return the index plus one, which would be five. Let's look at the code for the solution. We start off with our while loop, which checks if the index is still less than the length of the encoding. If it is, it also checks if n is greater than the current frequency. While both of these conditions are true, we do what I mentioned earlier, which is subtract from n the remaining frequency for this encoding value, and then we move on to the next encoding value. Once the while loop fails, we need to do two things. First, we need to check if our index is still in bounds. If it's not in bounds, then we can just return negative one. However, if it is in bounds, then we have to subtract what is left from our current index, which is the frequency of this encoding value. And finally, we can return the index plus one, which is the value itself of this encoding. I think if you understand the brute force solution, this improved solution should be pretty straightforward. So I'm gonna skip the tracing and move to analyze the time and space. Once again, if we let s be the length of the original sequence and n be the length of the encoding, our time complexity has now changed from O of s to O of n over two, which is equivalent to O of n. This is an improvement because in most cases, the length of the encoding n is going to be significantly smaller than the length of the original sequence. For example, we had this as our encoding. The length of our original sequence is going to be 1025 plus 2034, which is going to be 3059. This is as opposed to the length of, of n over two, which is two. Our space complexity has remained unchanged. It's still constant space if you don't consider the input array, or n space if you do consider the input array as extra space. Well, that is it for this video. To recap, we went over two solutions, a slower solution, which decremented the frequencies in the encoding one by one, and then we improve the solution by instead subtracting off as much frequency as possible in a single iteration. I hope you found this video somewhat useful. Thank you very much for watching and good luck on all your interviews.